this one on? Yeah. I probably go underneath this. My wife always tells me, quiet, talk quiet. So, <laughs> anyway, good morning. We're glad you're here if you're visiting. If this is your first time, if you've been here since the start of this journey, uh, we welcome you. We love you and look forward to getting to know you better. Everybody have a bulletin. The schedule of new groups and everything that's going on is in here. So we want you to be informed. Uh, we are so glad to be back. Uh, Ed Edward, Matt, all uh, myself were gone last week and just love what's going on here. Love what God's doing in spite of if we're here or not. So have a special treat this morning. Look right under the front of your chair. There's, there's a, they're scattered. They're not on every chair, but they're scattered throughout. There's an envelope on the front of your chair. I know there's, I know there's one back there. I know there's one right in here. Look in the chair next to you if it's empty because there's... <laughs> There we go. Ted and Dave's got one. Hold them up. Okay. This is a $25 gift card to Blue Marlin Restaurant. But there's a catch. It's not for you. Okay. It's to bless somebody else. We are in the community to love people and we want to, we want to love them through you. Grocery store, yeah, everybody. Blue Marlin, they got it. They, they know who's up here, so they, they understand. Um, if, you, if you are worried about where your next meal's coming from, that's for you. Otherwise, and it's for to bless somebody else. And I would challenge most of us, we are blessed beyond. Amen. So we don't have to have a card to do that on our own. So let's love people this week. Um, let me pray for pray over the service. Father, thank you so much um, for what you're doing here, what you're doing in this community. It's exciting. May we uh, hold on to your hope. May we encourage each other. Um, just continue to guide us. Uh, as we do life together and love you and love people. Thank you. We love you. Uh, it's in your name we pray. Amen. We have Mason. Glad to have you. And right after this service, if you guys are interested in knowing more about One Two's About, about how we got here, we're going to have free food upstairs. We're giving an introduction of what that looks like. So it should be about an hour or so. Uh, and we'd love yeah. to have you guys come join if you want to know more about what we're all about, all right? Thanks. Yep.
Mason, welcome to 12 Church. I laugh because now you guys are forced to sit up close. Tell them out, I love it. This, I laugh because this is so typical of, of my personality and this church as I'm now preaching with a bunch of cornhole bags up on this platform here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, real quick, um, we have an awesome group starting up. Uh, I'm getting a little echo or team. Maybe it's just me. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, I'll, I'll power through it. But there's a uh, a new amazing men's group that is forming. But here's the catch. Right now, we can only do eight. So Jim in the back, there he is. Jim is gonna start a new group and it's called Fishers of Men. So if you like to be out on the water, if you like to fish, even if you don't like to fish and you wanna hang out, this, this is how amazing and simple it's gonna be. You're gonna talk about Jesus and then you're gonna go on a boat and fish for a while. Um, so what it's gonna be is two groups of four, because of the size of the boat. And it's also going to be Jack. Jack, where are you at? <laughs> Jack, how are you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> so Jack and Jim will be, uh, what's that song? Jack and Jim. <laughs> will be uh, out there uh, talking about Jesus and, and catching fish, hopefully. Um, the sign up is on this back table. Now, don't run too quickly because I've got a lot to share today. But uh, there's two groups, and so what will happen is one week, the uh, six of you, so four of you, and then Jim and Jack will meet, and then the following week will be that other group, and then you'll just keep rotating like that. And then uh, if you miss your chance and you really want to get on this, um, this will last for a little bit, and then we'll stop, and then we'll start a, a, a different group of people. Um, and also, Jack, I know, loves shore fishing, too, right? Am I uh, volunteering for something that you don't want to do? <laughs> so if you miss the group, maybe Jack will take you out. Um, also, uh, Edward and Tiffany, they, uh, the beginning of the year, they feel led to do a marriage small group. So whether you're thinking about getting married, in marriage, you want to be with your significant other, talk to Edward, talk to Tiffany, and we'll get you signed up for that. But what I'd love to is the, uh, the comment that I received was, I've been to a lot of churches, and no one has really asked me what I like to do and found a spot for that. So I'm bringing that before the church now. If you're passionate about something, you're like, well, that doesn't fit in the typical style of church small group. If you haven't noticed yet, we're not the typical church. And so if you come to me and you're like, I really like hunting for shells, you can get a group of people because what we stress here at One Two Church is relationship. Relationship with Jesus and relationship with each other. That's why we call it One Two Church, love God, love others. So if you're like, hey, I would love to get a group of people out and we can do this, come to me, we'll talk about it. And uh, it can be as simple as talking about what was talked about in the sermon while you're doing it. That's a small group. Um, I haven't even introduced myself. <coughs> For those who knew my pastor now, along with my wife of 21 years, that's a long time. Yeah, 21 years, um, came from Washington and started a church here. but. I hope you guys know that I'm passionate about Jesus above all else. That's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about people, I'm passionate about Jesus, and that, that's gonna come through, but um, there's a start of this sermon series, and maybe you guys saw the post or you heard the talk about it and it intrigued you, but this sermon series is entitled Flog. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take six subjects, six people from the Bible that were flawed and show you how Jesus ran after them. Jesus loved them for who they are. Um, 
and change the world because of these people. Today, today is an interesting one, and I'm wearing a sweater that I instantly regret because it is hot. But, um, I want you to know if you've ever had the thought, I can't come to church because fill in the blank. Now, if that has anything to do with the way that you are, the, that reason of being like, I'm so flawed. If I can preach in this church, then you can come in this church. We believe in, in a God that reaches people where they're at. And I want to have you guys take hold of the flaws that are in your life because it glorifies Jesus. He didn't come for the, those who were healed. He came for those who were sick. But we have it twisted. And we think that once you come into a church, you have to have all your stuff together. And I want to be maybe the first pastor in your life to tell you that that's not the case. That you can come in this building, you can love Jesus exactly where you're at right now. Because this is, too often, it's bad and defeating news when you go into church. This is the good news. I'm going to move this place and it's going to throw me off. We'll get you set up when you come back. Can you guys see me over these bags? <laughs> But uh, the background of the, the scripture that we're tackling, that's in Hebrews, this is a letter to Jesus' followers, first century Jesus' followers. And, and at this time, there were assassinations, there were beatings, there, there were tremendous trouble, the families were being ripped apart, were being hurt. It, it was very unpopular at this time to claim Jesus in your life, to claim that Jesus was God, and it was causing all of this hurt. And this is a lifeline love letter to the Hebrew people. There's urgency here. There's passion. There's very direct stories. They, these recipients need something to help them keep their faith. But I want to look at one subject today. One, one person, our first subject. And while we do this, I want you to look at your life. During the sermon series, I want you to look at your life and be like, God, where, where are you moving in my life? Like, what has kept me? What portions of my life, what sin in my life, what flaws in my life? have kept me from coming before you because you don't you don't have to have it all together to come before the Lord. But it's in Hebrews 11. It's 29 through 31. They call this the faith chapter because these, these men and women of faith they're being highlighted of why they're in this chapter of why they follow God. But it says by faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians when they attempted to do the same were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And here is our subject. By faith, Rahab the prostitute, the prostitute, 1,800 years after Rahab existed, she's still being called not a prostitute, but the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Do you, do you ever read the Bible and just kind of chuckle a little bit? No? Just me? Because <laughs> when I read this, I'm like, she, she gave a friendly welcome <laughs> to the spies. I bet she did. Yeah. Well, let's look for it, because I need it. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you for uh, who you are. Lord, I ask that you anoint and bless this sermon series, that those who are struggling with being able to come into a church building or come before you, just the thoughts that cause hurdles and missteps, that Lord, we know that that's who you run towards, that your love is focused on that. So I ask that you, you heal the hearts during the sermon series, that you, you open the minds of those who have these objections about themselves, about others, to know that you are love. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I've talked about this before, but I, I played basketball, track, cross country, and football in high school. It was a small school. We didn't have cuts. We, if, you, if you could tie your shoes and put on a uniform, you were on the team. And I remember this very well because it is 
one of the most embarrassing moments in my junior year is we were playing basketball and I didn't get a lot of playing time. So between my junior and senior year, I went from being a, one of the shortest kids in class to the tallest kid in class. So my junior year was like this weird, awkward stage and I didn't know much about the sport. I just knew girls showed up when you played basketball. So I was like, let's go there, let's do that. And so I was playing and my coach, we were in the district um, championship. So you win, you go to state. If you lose, you go home. And he puts me in the game because one of our starters got hurt. And we were, we were there and the shot goes up and I remember the ball's coming right to me. I'm like, hey Lord, this is amazing. Thank you for this. And I grab the ball and I turn and it's a wide open court. There is nobody there. And I'm like, Let's go this way. So I start dribbling and dribbling and dribbling, and I go, and I'm like, don't mess this up, don't mess this up. And it's a perfect layup, and I'm all excited, jumping around, and my coach is like, what are you doing? Apparently it was the opposite basket that I We lost the game, but not by two points, so I felt better about that. <laughs> then in track my junior year, I was running the two mile, which is eight laps, and that was my sport, I loved it. And I get to the, where the finish line is, and there's a guy behind me, and I run and I just stop after the finish line. And I'm, I'm starting to walk off of the track, and my coach yells at me, and he says, you're only on lap six. <laughs> so I went on, I'm like, this, this, this is not good for my image. <laughs> Senior year, playing basketball, district championships again. Another, I, I was a starter at that time. The ball comes to me almost exactly the same, and I grab it and I look, and it's an open court, and my first thought is what? Oh, where's my basket? Is it this way or is it this way? And I realize that open court is my basket. So I put my head down and I start dribbling. I start dribbling, 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 and my coach is yelling, go, go, go. And I'm looking down the whole time because my thought is, do not mess this up. Don't mess it up. So I'm dribbling, and then I get this thought in my head. I was like, I'm not going to dunk because I'm not a show off, and I couldn't at that time. <laughs> but I start thinking, what am I going to do? Focus, and then I say, it's time to elevate. Like, it is time to go towards the basket. So I jump, pick up the ball. And I realized the rim is like way here, and I'm jumping free throw line. <laughs> and I have a decision to make. Do I throw it off the backboard, grab it, and dump it? And go, I've seen that done before. No, I can't do that. <laughs> do, what, what do I do? So in my head, I just say, OK. And I come down, and I just finger roll, and it slams off the backboard and goes. And my coach looks at me and says, what are you doing? <laughs> and I had no, I had no idea. We lost that game too. <laughs> but have you ever been in your life grinding, working, grinding, grinding, and you look up and you say, I should be a lot farther along than I am right now. I feel so far away. And maybe when it comes to the subject of God, you say, I'm not even close to God. Like, I've been doing my devotionals. I've been doing everything that, that I've been asked to do. And I look up and I say, God, you're not even close to me. Like, there, there's nothing here. I thought God would be here. I thought we'd have this relationship. Maybe you're here, you, you showed up, you're watching online. And you can be honest with yourself about your faith, about God, about these concepts. And you're like, I'm not even close, Pastor. I'm not, I'm not even close to the rim. Like, what, what is going on? I thought this, have you ever felt this way? There's a number of reasons that we feel this way. One could be our own performance. One could be a lack of interest. One could be a lack of spirituality, of good works. Or here's the last one, your flaws. Those weaknesses in your life, those sins in your life. Or you've tried it, and you've tried to be good, you've tried to be noble, you've tried to be one of those good churchgoers, you've tried to be faithful, and you say, I tried it, it did not work for me. 
Have you ever felt that your prayers hit the ceiling and then fell right back on the side of your bed? Where you're like, I'm not even close. Like, I'm shouting to you, God. And I'm, I'm doing everything I can, and you're not answering. I'm not even close. And the reasons we feel this way, we feel far from God, is sometimes we blame ourselves. Other times we blame God. God doesn't even care. Okay? I'm not close. There's like this massive canyon between me and God. This huge space and a preacher like me gets on stage and starts to talk about how God loves you. And you sit back and you check out and you say, that does not apply to me. Like everything that I've done in my life, that he cannot love me. He couldn't care. How could he care about me because of what I've done in my life? Like if this is a holy and almighty God, how could he care about me with everything that I have going on. I'm not sure I believe. I used to believe. But maybe not anymore. God? And there's a can. There's a gap between us. I'm not close. In this series, I, I want to talk about how you are exactly who God wants. You are exactly right now where you're at. This word faith. We talk about this all the time. Faith. And it's a Greek word that is dominantly in the New Testament where it means it literally means persuade or persuaded where does this come from? where does this persuasion come from it doesn't come from yourself you can't persuade yourself why because if you could persuade yourself to believe in Jesus then you would step back and say I had a part in that like because I forced myself to believe. This persuasion only comes from God. Faith is literally divine persuasion. But let's ask ourselves an important question as we start off this series. How far will divine persuasion go? How far? How far will God go to get to you? God is persuasive. He's, he's persuading you. Maybe you've checked yourself out of this equation because of the life that you've lived, or the mistakes that you feel like you've made, or who you are, far from God. And that's when Rahab the prostitute comes into the story. Did you notice, can we go back to uh, the very first slide? Do you notice this? By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And then it talks about Rahab right after that. Let's go to the next slide. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient. Did you notice that Joshua isn't even mentioned in this list, what Rahab is? Joshua is the one who is leading the winning nation to march around Jericho for it to fall and he's not even mentioned in the faith chapter, but a prostitute is. And I wonder if God knew that there would be people reading this that felt a million miles away from God. That God wasn't even close. Because inserted in this list of ancient Jewish Hebrew leaders is mentioned one that's not even Jewish. Rahab is not, not a Hebrew. She's a foreigner. She's a Canaanite. Furthermore, in ancient biblical times, she's a woman, which as ridiculous as it is, she was seen as less than a man. So not only a Jew, she's a foreigner, she's a woman. And what was her occupation? Oh. Prostitute. 1,800 years after practicing prostitution, she still has the title. And I want to submit to you today that God wants us to see how far, how far this divine persuasion will go. You feel far from God? How far? Far. Far. I feel, I feel fly. I feel broken. I feel hurt. I feel beat down. How far do you feel? How far does this divine persuasion go? Faith is not me going, all right, God. Hold on a sec. Okay, I'm ready for you, God. Let's go. And God is like, whoo, about time. Thank you so much. I'm like, let's go. Let's go on. That, that is not what this is, that, but that is a very prevalent narrative in the streets of this community and in this country and in this world. A million times over, you hear, I can't come into church because why? The place will burn down. I can't come into church because lightning will strike me as I go in there. I can't come to church because did you see what I did last night? 
I can't come into church because my family history is this. I can't come into church. And so we put it all on, on us. And we say, give me some lead time. Let me put myself together. Let me get rid of these flaws. And, and let me cover this. Let me work this out. And then I will come to church. And there are many people in this room, myself included, that I have made those statements. Where I tell Crystal, you can go to church. I can't go to church because of what I did yesterday. They wouldn't want me in that building. But I want to tell you what type of church this is and what, what kind of God we serve. There was a gentleman that was talking to me at a restaurant this week. And he, he came to me and he sat by me and he said, I'm really happy for you. This peace that you have, this love that you bring, I'm really happy for you. But I can't come to church. And he listed why he couldn't come to church. And I looked at him in the face and I said, your excuses don't work for me. Like there is no excuse that you can give me that will stop God's love from going straight after you. And you being able to walk in this building. He kept saying, you're not understanding my lifestyle. You're not understanding what I'm doing. And I said, you're not understanding me. There is absolutely no excuse that you could give me where I'm like, oh, yeah, whoops, God can't do that. Get yourself together and then come into church. No, we're still subject to something that is not biblical. And it, it's still spoken that people can't come to God until you cover your flaws. That you can't come before our almighty Savior with this because you're like, no, i got to get myself right. Some of you don't have this history, but there's still churches today that if you want to be a part of the church, you walk in the first Sunday, you're like, I like this church, I want to come back. And there will be a leader, or somebody who walks up, puts, puts his arm around you and says, okay, if you want to continue coming to this church, here's the steps that you have to take in order to keep coming to this church. That makes me angry. But it happens where they say, okay, now you can't smoke. You can't drink and you can't hang out with girls that do. You got to cover those tattoos. You got to do everything you can because we have an image to reflect. We we are sharing. I'm, I'm going on, but I, we are sharing. Do you understand this? A perfect Savior, not a perfect us. We are pointing to Him and saying everything, everything that you died for, we can put in that category of our life, but we still think and we still have people saying, no, you got to get right before you come to church. That's how culture has been created sometimes in church. And since church is a representation of God, people go, if church is like this, God must be like this. Like this man put his arm around me and said, you got to stop doing all these things. I'm going to come before God if it's, a, if it's an example of God. I've got to come before the Father. And I'm like, I've got to get rid of all these things before I can come to you. I don't know my Sunday best. People say, put on your Sunday best. And you may be in a spot where you're like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I don't know. I'll come back when I get this stuff together. Once again, I'll ask you, how far will God go to persuade you? How far does that divine persuasion go further than you could ever imagine? Here's an observation. Rahab is clearly persuaded by God. God says, I choose Rahab. But by the way, that in and of itself is indicative of who our God is. He scans the city of Jericho to be like, I'm going to go to the brothel owner and I'm choosing her. Think about how wild this is. You say, I choose you, and the persuasion has already begun. Think about this. She's persuaded behind the walls. Behind the walls. Someone needs to hear this. Persuaded behind the walls. If you look at the, the uh, city of Jericho, investigate these Jericho walls. They're thick. They're massive. They sit up on a cliff. And it says that they were stunning to look at. It's overwhelming for an opponent that in any way, shape, or form that they could scale those walls. But I want, I want you to get this picture in your head because that's how far divine persuasion goes. You have this massive city, fortified city. I wonder, do you have walls? 
Do you have walls that are going to come up in your, in your life? God scales those walls. You may say, this is it. I'm done. I, I'm not going to do this anymore. Have you hidden behind walls? Have there been walls of hurt? Have other so-called Jesus followers manipulated you, hurt you? Now you start to build the walls within us. The, the God we're speaking of today is not a God who condemns you for your walls. Please hear me. He is not a God that condemns you for your walls. There are people in this room, you have built walls to survive. That's it. Or you had to build walls. We picture God in heaven condemning us because how dare you build walls because someone heard you. No. The Bible tells us that we are dust. That we are fragile. There's so much fragility. That God, I don't, I don't want this hurt. I don't, I don't want to hurt anymore. So we build walls, and we say, I can't do this anymore. I can't put myself out there. And what some people will tell you, you need to tear down those walls so God can walk in. I want to be the pastor in your life today that says that God is going to walk through those walls. That God is going to go over those walls. That God can scale any walls. He can remove the wall. Don't focus on the wall, church. Don't focus on... This church is not focusing on helping people with their walls. We all have them, by the way. We all have walls. I have one big one against the New England Patriots. That's a wall that Tom Brady could never scale. I can't even talk about it. Church. <laughs> Any Patriots fans? God bless this church. <laughs> we can spend the rest of our life saying, I need to tear down this wall first. Okay? I need to tear down this wall. And we're focused on the walls. I need to tear this one down. Or we can declare we believe in a God that goes through our walls to, to choose us and to meet us. I'm making a bold statement today. If you're here, or if you're watching online, the persuasion has already begun. If you're here and you're like, I, I, I don't know, God. You're here. The persuasion has already been done in your, in your life. I can choose to, to make you feel bad about your walls. Or we can look at Rahab and say, if God can scale those walls with this divine persuasion, he can go right through my walls. And he can persuade me as well. But I dare you, I dare you to say, okay, God, get through these walls. I dare you to say, I, I have met people that I love that have literally said, God, come find me. I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm gone. I'm going to be somewhere else. Come find me. And God has reached out. There are stories that people will have a dream about a Jesus, about saving Jesus, and they wake up and they step back and leave their entire culture, their entire family, their entire religion because they've been persuaded by God. There was no persuasion on their end of being like, I need to believe this. No, God got to them in a dream. How far does this go? She was persuaded while practicing prostitution. Some people have tried to remove that she wasn't a prostitute. That she was just a real friendly lady. She was friendly. All right. but they, because we're uncomfortable with this reality of God. We're uncomfortable that God will reach somebody like that. That will persuade somebody like that. God chose Rahab and from scholars saying that she was not just selling her body. She was helping other ladies sell their bodies too. And God reached her. God persuaded her. I'm not, I'm not trying to be crude. But when you read Hebrews 11... She wasn't destroyed because she gave the spies a friendly welcome. Now that, I want you to know that she did hide them and protect them. But friendly welcomes is what she did. Like that, that's what she did. And by the way, these spies were probably not entirely pure hearted. We can read before that and see different things that they would do. But they walk in and they're like, where should we hang tonight? That's, good. That's a kind of cool place. It's got a bar vibe. There's, there's some friendly ladies. Let's just stay here. That's real, church. That were, that's what was happening. Rahab was a prostitute, but evidently while practicing this, God's love was already at work. God's love was already working when she was making money, doing what she was doing. And I think, uh, I thought we told people, listen, 
Listen, listen, listen. Point window, listen. <laughs> if you change, God's going to love you. But that's not good news. It, no, the news is so good that God is crazy about you. Who? Who? Me? You know, you know what I've done. Do you know what I do? I'm not sure it's totally relevant. God is crazy about you. There's people listening right now. You have believed you are far from God because of the life that you live. Let me say it this, like this. If you wonder where God's at, read the stories about where Jesus went. You would be shocked where God intentionally hangs out. You may say, Pastor, how do you know? Because look at where Jesus went out. He didn't come for the religious. He didn't come for those who thought that they had their life all together. If, if your lifestyle reflects anything like we're talking about today and the people we will be talking about in the coming weeks, I could argue that God's love is with you a lot and even more maybe than others sometimes. And you may say, how can you, how can you say that? Look at who Jesus ran after. Look at, the, look at the lost sheep where he ran after. Him. Look at the lost coin where he tore, that she tore everything up to look for that lost coin. Look at where Jesus goes to, where he hangs up. Jesus loves broken people. Jesus is moved with compassion towards those diseased, towards those hurting, broken, flawed, marginalized, dismissed, overlooked. He's drawn to these people. God's been persuading you, and he will keep persuading you. And you may say, Pastor, are you trying to persuade me? No. If I can persuade you that God is real, then somebody else could come and unpersuade. I don't even think that's a word. Unpersuade you that, that God isn't real. So if I, as a human, could persuade you on something, someone else could walk in here and unpersuade you. One, two, church is not a community where we try to persuade people. That's what God does. We're leaving that all on God. But this is the evidence here. These spies from Joshua's team, so you have this, the city of Jericho and the Canaanites. Joshua took over leadership from Moses, and he's leading this country, God's country, called, it, called Israel. And they have some wins already, don't they? We they talked about it. The Red Sea, win. Two kings that they, uh, they took over, win. The word is out that they have this momentum. And the next thing God says, we're going to take down Jericho. This is the, a much bigger fish than anything else that they've been going through. Jericho is, is a significant city. This is a fortified city. And Joshua and the chosen people, to demonstrate God's power, Joshua sends in spies, and that's how the story unfolds. He sends them into the city walls. They go into Jericho, and they choose Rahab's spot to hang out. And then this happened. The, king's, the king, who has a direct line to Rahab, goes to her and says, I know those people are with you. And she looks at them and said, they were with me. I sent them out. They left. If you get your team and go, you can catch them. And so they went out after them. And she makes up this story for the king. And then she goes and hides them up on the roof under some barley. And uncover, after she goes up there, after they all leave to go chase these people that aren't even out there, she goes up, uncovers them, says, hey, you're safe. And they're saying thanks and Let's look at this next verse, what happens. For we have heard, I want you to get this, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Zion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And I love this part. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So in Rahab's time, there's a lot of gods. There were, there were a lot of gods that people would worship. The most popular god was the, this, get the, the gold, the big stuff, the, the, the money. That was the concept back then. And get this. This prostitute, Canaanite, living in a fortified city, says to these scared spies, 
I think your God is the God. Look at her verbiage here. There is no spirit left in any man because he, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on earth beneath. You mean this woman who's living in the lifestyle that she is, is persuaded by rumors on the street. This is what we don't talk a lot about. God will use a lot of things to persuade you. And you may say, I need to go to church and hear a preacher. Cool. Glad you're here. I love it that you're here. But God will use rumors about him to persuade you. God persuades people all over, all over the world. We just talked about that in dreams or people moving or running into somebody and hearing about something that happened. There's record in scripture that God used the donkey to talk to someone. And now he's using another one to stand on the stage. <laughs> you would be shocked, shocked at who God can use to persuade you or what God can use to persuade you. Rumors. She's so persuaded that Rahab says, I'm with you guys. Now, for those that know the end of the story, God literally, he pushes the wall down. And what's cool about this, when I was a kid, I always had this picture, mental picture in my mind that it just crumbled and spilled out. No, push, literally pushed a wall down and it was used as a ramp to get into the city where they overtook the city and then they burned the city. So God literally pushes this down. And we know the end of the story is that God's team wins. But hold on a minute. If you were Rahab, the odds are in your favor at that moment. Quick glimpse of the story. Joshua and that nation are in tents and trees outside of the city. And I, want to, I want to tell Rahab, you live in one of the most impressive cities in the world. And she says to these spies, I am with you. I believe that your God is the God. I, I want to... If I was interviewing, pause the scene, quick side interview, what are you thinking? Like, this is just an upstart nation. I don't even think they'll get a guy at the wall. Like, no one's ever been able to do this. What are you thinking? She says, I'm with you guys. And she says, if I help you, will you not kill us? Will you save my family? And they're like, oh, for sure. But I thought, look at this divine persuasion. She's so persuaded She's persuaded past obvious contradiction around me. Let's talk about faith. Look at Rahab. These Hebrews know the story of Rahab. She's someone of the Lord with this recipients of this letter because she's about to give up her culture. She's about to give up everything. She's about to give up her way of life. Everything will change because why? Either she will die or she will be a foreigner amongst a brand new upstart nation. And she says, I'm with them. Any logical thinking person will look at the scene and be like, you're crazy. Look at Jericho. Look at the guys in the tents and the trees. Look at Jericho. Look at the guys and the gals in the, in the tents and the trees. Do you want to live in trees? Or do you want to live in Jericho where everything's fortified and you have all that, all, that I want, all you want? And this Canaanite woman has become so persuaded. How? God. Rahab was building the faith of the, the guys, the spies, on God's team. They were telling her, we're all scared. And Rahab said, we have all been talking about you. And the rumors are here. We know what you're doing. I want I want to know a faith that contradicts everything around me but still knows that it's true. That's what I mean. God loves me where I, am, where I am now. That God persuades me where I am now. There's people here who feel a million miles away and God is saying, remember Rahab. She was really persuaded, not by her own doing, but by God. That she sided with God's people in the fields while her people were, in fort were fortified in their walls. Who does that? Someone who is persuaded by God. There will always be an element of following Jesus, church, that all others who have not yet been persuaded, they won't understand. They won't. Like, you're so crazy. You're involved in community. You just love people. Do you, you realize what that person did to you? You need to hold on to that, that this forgiveness. You need to do you for a bit. You need to take care of you. It's, it's not about that. 
It, it's about Jesus loving me where I am now, flaws and all. She's so persuaded that the joy she makes will cost her starting all over again. Hear me. It's going to cost her starting all over again. Think of this. What did she lose? She has to go to a brand new nation or she dies in the city walls. I know there's people in here who've lost friends because of them following Jesus. Who've lost maybe employment, have lost social status, have lost money. Or you feel like you've started all over again. Rhea thought, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna start all over again. And I'm reminded of Jesus when, he, when he's like, unless you become like a child, you won't understand what I'm doing, which is unless you start over again. And some of us need a rewire. I do. Of the things that I experienced, or things that I was told, or things that I learned. And I just, I'm like, God, can I start all over again with just you? Rahab, now that you've sided with the, with the people in the field, if they lose, which most likely, based on stats and research, this big city is not going to lose to a bunch of guys in trees. Your people, your team, they will kill you when they find out that you help them. On the flip side, if the field people actually win, you'll be talked about in that country forever and not always in a good light. She still has that title. As this is, Astrid, this is what you want? Look how far God goes to love flawed people. There's a real God that starts to persuade your soul and your whole being to the point where you're like, he's real. He forgave me. I love him. And, and I'm with him. Come hell and high water, I'm with him. That's divine persuasion. And that's not, that's not a good sermon from a, from a preacher where you say, you're like, that was a good sermon, I'm in. Let's do that. No. No, I can't. I can never do that. A, a community starts to form where people say, I couldn't say no. He revealed himself. He revealed everything. He changed everything. He persuaded me. Flaws and all. It says, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes, which is the word of just receiving this, shall not perish but have everlasting life. What we have to know, talk about it, in Rahab, thousands of years before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, where he changes history. This is a beautiful example of what happens when we receive and yield to divine persuasion. We start all over again. We start again. Rahab started again. Starting over is weird, church. It's weird, let's be honest. Because you only get, you not only get a new beginning, but things are foreign. Things are different. I just don't, I don't want you just to attend church. I just want you to love Jesus. I want you to follow Jesus. You say every day, that's the plan. We'll give it our best shot. And people have asked, why do you do it? I can't help it. I, I have a choice, I do, but he's the realest being in the universe. He died for me. He loves me like no one ever has loved me. Your realization of your flaws, that makes him run to you, not away from you. Someone needs that today. Your realization of, yes, this is where I am. God's like, let me get that. Let me go after that. Let me run after that. He doesn't run away. He runs towards the mess. He runs towards the broken. And why follow him? I know he's God. I love him. There, there's nothing blind about it. When they say blind, okay, there's nothing blind about it. I know his track record. I know what he does, and I, I know no matter what flaw that I can bring before him or what I have, I'll be with him for eternity because he persuaded me. Rahab, you gave up all of this. Do you know we find out later on in Scripture that Rahab got married, settled down, had a family? Do you know what blows me away? Do you know that Rahab was related to Jesus? She goes from a prostitute in the walls of the most fortified cities in the world to believing in God and mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew as a relative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? 
This is a process. We've got why. Why bring the Savior into the world this way? Because her life is a picture of what happens when someone yields to the divine persuasion of God, flaws it all, and comes forward and says, that, that is what I want. I want that. I, I want to say that some of you are already being persuaded. I, I don't know who I'm talking to here, but there's someone here, and I'm going to apply this last point differently. You love Jesus. You've been persuaded at some point. You've received the free gift of forgiveness. But God is asking you to yield even more. I want to ask you, stop trying to cover your flaws and allow them to honor Jesus. Allow the flaws to glorify Jesus. Jesus, Jesus showed his scars because it saved our life. And he's asking, will you show me what you have? Can you show me those flaws that you have? Can you show me those struggles you have? Can you show me those weaknesses that you have? Because I'm not running. God is asking you to step out and accept you as you are right now and allow him to do the work in your life. Without my flaws, I'm going to be up here today. The, the God that used a very flawed woman to become an become part of the family tree of Jesus is the same God asking you to be a part of his family today. He wants you to wade out into the deep end and trust him. You and I, church, are recipients of this. We're recipients of this letter. God used flawed people. That's who he used. The, the same God who was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God used this flawed woman, then you and I can stand strong in our brokenness and bask in the persuasion of our God. We haven't come this far for God to go back on us, to turn his back on us. Will it be hard? Yeah, for us. But I didn't decide to follow Jesus to cash it in when the world got hard or when my world got dark. No, I will never be perfect, but I follow a God who is, and he loves every part of me because he sees his son in me. You know, without the brokenness of me, you couldn't see Jesus in me. Jesus filled every flaw that I had, every crack, every broken part. And I want the record to show that there's a group of people in South Padre and in Port Isabel and in Australia and in England and Canada and California and Washington and wherever you're watching right now who stayed the course, who were per persuaded by God, who stepped out and showed their flaws to point to a flawless Savior that it wasn't us that got our life together and then came to God, but a group of people who came up, stood up and said, this is who I am, mess and all. But I love a God that has no mess. And he took all of my mess. My life is not dictated on, on my flaws. I am who I am by the grace of God. My life is a direct result of a Savior who walked through every wall that I put up. And he scaled every, every single wall, put his arms around me and said, I love you. That is what my life is about. I was a drug addict felon trying to take his life with the divorce papers on the table and God looked at me and said, I love that. I love that boy. I want you a part of my family. How messed up is this grace? This is what grace is about. It's like God looked upon me in my darkest time and he was like, I can use this. Oh boy, can I use this? Now will you come with me? Will you come and walk my direction and let me feel this? Someone needs to hear this at the end. God cannot love you any more or any less than he does right now. And I don't care what you did this morning, last night, last week, or last year. God cannot love you any more or less than he does right at, at this exact moment. What have you done, church? I bet you God can get to that. What wall have you built up? I bet you God can scale that. What hurt have other people caused? God can get to that too. Just like I told that man this week, your excuses don't work with me, they don't work with God. He wants you. There's a God that wants you right now. He wants you to, he wants to go to your deepest hole and bring you out and say, I died for that too. Can I shine through those clouds? Can I get to this point where I can shine through those things that you bring before me? God used a prostitute to bring forth a baby Jesus. 
There's no excuse or no, no reasoning why we cannot come before our almighty God. And I want to invite you to that journey now. And I'm not inviting you to religion. I'm inviting you into a romance, a passionate following of a real God who will never leave you, will never forsake you, and I don't care what you have done. And your life is not defined by your flaws. It is defined by a flawless God and his love. You stand with me. I want to pray over this entire church. And I want you to, as I'm praying, I want you to think of those things, those roadblocks, those, those issues maybe in your marriage, maybe in your own personal life, your relationship with your kids, or things, maybe addictions, or issues that you're really struggling with. And I want you to know that if God can use this woman, then he can use what you have. And do you know my most powerful sermon is the life that God brought me out of and said those were the flaws, but here is the flawless Jesus. Here is the perfect Jesus. So as I'm praying, church, I want you to think of those roadblocks and say, God, can you have that? God, can you get to this too? And challenge God. If you built a wall so high, you don't think anyone can get to it, ask him to walk through it. And it's scary, but he will walk through it. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking you, put your hand on every single person here, every single person watching, to let them realize that no matter what they have done, that is not the focus. It's all about you. And Lord, I want you to persuade these people under the sound of my voice, persuade them not about this sermon, not about the word, but about you. That only you can, can persuade every single person in here. Only you can persuade those watching online and those we will meet in this community this coming week. Only you can persuade them. There's already rumors on the street about you, God. Let us be those people who show and show up and say, yes, I'm a mess. I'm broken. But look at my perfect Jesus. And Lord, as I pray over these people, I want you to put in their mind, put in their hearts, something that they have used as a reason why they couldn't come before you. And I'm right now, Lord, I want you to take that from them so they can walk freely towards you, that they can go after you, that, they, that you will run with them and work through them. Lord, I pray for healing over everyone under the sound of my voice. Healing from hurts, past, present, and future. Healing, Lord, from, from those that sin that is in their life that they thought would, would just always be there. And Lord, I want you to persuade them right at this time, Lord, that you are real. That you sent your son to live a perfect life, yet died a sinner's death. You died our death. That is our cross. You died for us. And all we have to do is believe that you rose again three days later, defeating death, granting us access to you. And if you prayed that prayer this week, I want you to write it down on the card. I'm not asking for hands raised. I want God to persuade you, not my microphone, not me. I want God to persuade you. But I want to know how I can pray for you. And Father, we love you. We love this church. And we love what you're doing. Persuade us this week, Lord. Get to us. And we know you will. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can remain standing. We're going to invite Mason up here. I love you guys. Remember, right after this, upstairs is a free lunch with some really cool guys. I love you.
Thank mm-hmm. you.